one of the things that we focus on is energy poverty. So what is energy poverty? It quite simply is the lack of access to clean, renewable energy. Energy poverty pr primarily affects health care, education, and economic development. And women and girls are affected most of all. Electricity is very important to our society. Unfortunately, many people don't have that very access to electricity. So you can, you can see a map of the global energy poverty um, throughout the world. So you can see that India has one of the biggest populations that lack even and access to electrical grids. So there's about 836 million people just in India who don't have any access to electricity and are practically living in the darkness. Now next, Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa have one of the biggest populations that don't have any access. All right, so let me show you some quick facts about the situation currently. So 17% of the global population is not connected to the electrical grid at all. Seven out of 10 people in Sub-Saharan Africa do not have any access to lighting. So they're living practically in the darkness every day. And 30% of health facilities in Africa, as well as more than 30% of primary schools in Africa don't have any electricity to work with. So students have to work maybe with kerosene lamps, they have to work practically in the dark and have to do their homework in the dark as well. So the major reasons for this current situation that's occurring, especially in sub-Saharan Africa and South America, is that there's a lack of financial resources. So many of these nations are undeveloped. They don't have the monetary funds to even support a extensive in infrastructure and electrical grid. Now, there are also geographical barriers. So many of these countries don't even have a location that would be suitable for any electric grid. So let's say like a mountainous region, you're in the middle of the mountains, and the, the nation can't connect you even to the electrical grid. And lastly, there's a lack of extensive infrastructure. Without the monetary funds to support even electric grid, and without the infrastructure, you can't have any electricity. So there are several alternatives that many of these people use to just support them with the cooking and heating, maybe lighting that they even need. So in the first picture, you can see actually a kerosene lamp. So many of these individuals use very ex expensive kerosene lamps to provide the lighting that they need at, at night. Then there's also simple candles and open fires. But each of these has their own range of drawbacks. So first of all, there's increased pollution causing from like open fires. Many of these individuals have to walk like two, four, 10 to 20 miles even to get a piece of wood. And many of these pieces of wood come from forests, right? So they have to cut down forests to support this consumption. So that increases the use of black carbon, methane, CO2. These are just adding, not only affecting their society, but us through global warming as well. Then there's also deforestation. As I said, they're cutting down trees just to support those open fires. And as a result, through deforestation, there's also a lot of soil erosion. Lastly, and the most important issue is health risks. So um, some quick facts. So 50% of pneumonia, uh, deaths due to um, pneumonia are actually caused by air pollutants. So many of these children under five, they're just practically dying from these air pollutants caused and created by these kerosene lamps. So while they're actually using it to do their homework, they're at the same time affecting their own health. 3.8 million premature deaths from non-communicable diseases are actually caused from contact with these air pollutants. So like when you're using open fires, especially they're using it indoors, so imagine there's so much soot in the air, that they're, I mean, it's just dangerous for the lungs and for their own immune system. Because what happens in the developing world is we're cooking with wood or charcoal or worst of all, kerosene. And we're cooking in confined spaces. And so we're creating this toxic environment. It's like a soup where we're breathing in these fumes. Here's Fatima's kitchen. You can see the ceiling and all the soot on her ceiling of her kitchen. So what happens is women are breathing in these fumes. The World Health Organization said that women who cook with kerosene have the same lung capacity as a two-pack-a-day cigarette smoker. What about education? Think about your own school. What if it didn't have light or electricity? What if you couldn't do homework at night or your children couldn't do homework in their home? This is James. James is an orphan living in Malawi. His parents died of HIV AIDS. And this is the first time, this photo represents the first time he has ever done homework at night, and he's 16 years old. Can we do better? What if we could make energy do our work without working our undoing? Could we have fuel without fear? Could we reinvent fire? You see, fire made us human, fossil fuels made us modern, but now we need a new fire that makes us safe, secure, healthy, and durable. Let's see how. Four-fifths of the world's energy still comes from burning each year four cubic miles 
of the rotted remains of primeval swamp goo. Those fossil fuels have built our civilization, they've created our wealth, they've enriched the lives of billions, but they also have rising costs to our security, economy, health and environment that are starting to erode if not outweigh their benefits. So we need a new fire. And switching from the old fire to the new fire means changing two big stories about oil and electricity, each of which puts two-fifths of the fossil carbon in the air, but they're really quite distinct. Uh, less than one percent of our electricity is made from oil, although almost half is made from coal. Their uses are quite concentrated. Three-fourths of our oil fuels transportation, three-fourths of our electricity powers buildings, and the rest of both runs factories. So very efficient vehicles, buildings, and factories save oil and coal, and also natural gas that can displace both of them. But today's energy system is not just inefficient, it is also in disconnected, aging, dirty, and insecure. So it needs refurbishment. By 2050, though, it could become efficient, connected, and distributed with elegantly frugal autos, factories, and buildings all relying on a modern, secure, and resilient electricity system. We can eliminate our addiction to oil and coal by 2050 and use one-third less natural gas while switching to efficient use and renewable supply. Here's a little snapshot of 150 years of oil. And it's been a dominant part of our energy system for most of those 150 years. Now, here's another little secret I'm going to tell you about. For the last 25 years, oil has been playing less and less of a role in global energy system. There was one kind of peak oil in 1985, when oil represented 50% of global energy supply. Now it's about 35%. It's been declining, and I believe it will continue to decline. Gasoline consumption in the U.S. probably peaked in 2007 and is declining. So oil is playing a less significant role every year. Right? And, and so 25 years ago, there was a peak oil. Just like in the 1920s, there was a peak coal. And 100 years before that, there was a peak wood. This is a very important picture of the evolution of energy systems. And what's been taking up the slack in the last few decades? Well, a lot of natural gas and a little bit of nuclear, for starters. And what goes on in the future? Well, I think out ahead of us a few decades is peak gas. And beyond that, peak renewables. Now, I'll tell you another little very important story about this picture. Now, I'm, I'm not pretending that energy use in total isn't increasing. It is. That's another part of the story. Come talk to me about it. We'll fill in some of the details. But there's a very important message here. This is 200 years of history. And for 200 years, we've been systematically decarbonizing our energy system. Energy systems of the world becoming progressively, year on year, decade on decade, century on century, becoming less carbon intense. And that continues into the future with the renewables that we're developing today, reaching maybe 30% of primary energy by mid-century. We need solutions, either one or several, that have unbelievable scale and unbelievable reliability. And although there's many directions or people seeking, I really only see five that can achieve the big numbers. I've left out tide, geothermal, fusion, biofuels. Those may make some contribution, and if they can do better than I expect, so much the better. But my key point here is that we're going to have to work on each of these five, and we can't give up any of them uh, because they, they look daunting, because they all have significant challenges. Uh, let's look first at the burning fossil fuels, either uh, burning coal or burning natural gas. What you need to do there uh, seems like it might be simple, but it's not, and that's to take all the CO2 after you've burned it, going out the flue, pressurize it, create a liquid, put it somewhere, and hope it stays there. Now, we have some pilot things that do this at the 60 to 80 percent level, but getting up to that full percentage, that will be very tricky. And agreeing on where these CO2 quantities should be put will be hard. But the toughest one here is this long-term issue. Who's going to be sure? Who's going to guarantee uh, something that is literally billions of times larger than any 
type of waste you think of in, in terms of nuclear or other things. This is a lot of volume. So that's the top one. Next would be nuclear. It also has three big problems. Cost, particularly in highly regulated countries, is high. The issue of the safety, really feeling good about nothing can go wrong, that even though you have these human operators, that the fuel doesn't get used for weapons. And then where, what do you do with the waste? Now, although it's not very large, uh, there are a lot of concerns about that. People need to feel good about it. So three very tough problems uh, that might be uh, solvable and so should be worked on. The last three of the five I've grouped together. Uh, these are what people often refer to as the renewable sources. And they actually, although it's great they don't require fuel, they have some disadvantages. One is that the density of energy gather in these technologies is dramatically less than a power plant. This is energy farming. So you're talking about many square miles, thousands of times more area than, it, than you think of as a normal energy plant. Also, these are intermittent sources. Uh, the sun doesn't shine all day, it doesn't shine every day, and likewise the wind doesn't blow all the time. And so if you depend on these sources, you have to have some way of getting energy during those time periods that it's not available. So we've got big cost challenges here. Uh, we have transmission challenges. For example, say this energy source is outside your country. Uh, you not only need the technology, but you have to uh, deal with the risk of the energy coming from elsewhere. And finally, this storage problem. And to dimensionalize this, I went through and looked at all the types of batteries that get made for cars, for computers, for phones, for flashlights, for everything and compared that to the amount of electrical energy the world uses. And what I found is that all the batteries we make now could store less than 10 minutes of all the energy. And so, in fact, we need a big breakthrough here, something that's going to be a factor of 100 better than the approaches we have now. It's not, it's not impossible, but it's not a very easy thing. Now, this shows up when you try to get the, the intermittent source to be above, say, 20 to 30 percent of what you're using. If you're counting on it for 100 percent, you need a, an incredible miracle battery.